What's up, Barnhill family, and welcome back to your home for all things combat sports. Yo, yo. So, Nick, a lot of stuff to talk about in the world of MMA. We've got a great 205 matchup coming up, Alex Pereira versus Jan Blahovich. We've got UFC 289 this weekend. We have some predictions to make, but I want to kind of start on this weekend's news. It seemed like bad judging is kind of the dark cloud hanging over once again, and Chris Lee is the culprit once again. Kai Car of France lost a decision that he probably should have won to Ali Albazi. What did you make of the fight, first of all? And then second of all, do you think Car of France got robbed? You know, it's so crazy to, that we have to talk about this so often now. And, you know, for the longest time, people understood that fighting of all types is a, a subjective thing. And when you have judges that are humans scoring it, you don't really know what you're going to get. It's not like another sport where there's points on the board at the end of the time and you decide who's got the most and that's the winner. So uh, it does stink that MMA fans and boxing fans and all the combat sports fans are left with such headaches for decisions and victories and losses and whatnot. And I feel most bad for the people that bet on these types of things because, you know, if you would have bet on Kai Car France to win by decision, you would have thought you'd be, you know, cashing out last night. And I thought for sure he won that fight. And then the judges decide to pull something like that. So uh, it does sort of stink to see that. And it's happening more and more often now. You'd think as time progressed that the judging would get better, but it seems like it's at its all-time low, actually, for a while. It does seem like it's, an, it's at an all-time low, and it also seems like there's a couple people, and I hate to call people out you know, by name, but I think in reality, we kind of need to if we want the judging to be better and we want these judges to do better. Chris Lee has had some baffling decisions over the last year, and this one was nothing short of baffling. And the, the scorecard itself, if you look top to bottom the way he scored it, he scored rounds two, three, and four for Albazi, which... Okay, two and three, I can definitely see. I think three was the most clear-cut round for Albazi. But round four, it takes a novice MMA fan at most to tell you who won the fourth round of that fight. There was an attempt at a back take, which was thwarted by Cara France. That was the only real grappling attempt to speak of that Albazi had in that round. And then other than that, he landed five significant strikes, none of them which really did any damage. And Cara France landed almost 30. He landed almost six times more significant strikes in that particular round than did Albazi. And somehow Chris Lee scored that round for Albazi, which if he had just gotten that right, his scorecard would have been 48-47 in favor of Cara France, and it would have been a split decision the other way. So super unfortunate. Kai, we should be talking today about Kai being a contender in the flyweight division again and potentially the number one contender after a victory like that. But unfortunately, we're talking about him bumping back to maybe the four or five position and Albazi taking his spot at number three. Now, it is exciting to see new faces and new blood reach that top five at flyweight, but you hate to see it happen that way because Albazi did not win that fight. Yeah, I agree. And it does stink that, you know, he's going to go from number three, possibly to out of the top five. And Kai Carl France seems like a top three type of talent in my opinion at yeah. flyweight uh but to go back to the judging i think that when you see you know kai carl france go out there and, and and put on the kind of performance that he has and get robbed the way he got robbed in my opinion you know sometimes you, you have a close match and if it's a toss-up you, you you can understand where they might get some rounds off but we're talking about a clear decision victory for kai carl france and I know the judges aren't allowed to see the statistics of the fight. And it's really hard to try to keep track of who landed punches and, and try to count in your head. It's almost impossible. If you're a fan, you can watch and they'll bring up the stats every round. Like this person lands this many strikes versus this much. So you kind of have an idea. And then, of course, everything's subjective. You might see somebody land more power and less, you know, quantity, but, you know, way better quality. But when you've got like five strikes to 30, you don't even have to do the math. You can just be like, it's a lot to a little. And it was definitely in favor of Kai Car France. So I think the judging, you know, it, it was at an all-time low last night. I definitely could have seen Kai Car France winning that fight, doing really well on the microphone and setting himself up for a title fight here, probably at the end of this year, or, you know, maybe early next year. But, you know, now he's going to have to crawl his way back up to the top of flyweight. And that's just very difficult. And, you know, the UFC gets a lot of flack when this happens, but it really has nothing to do with the UFC. They aren't in control of the athletic commission. They aren't in control of the judges and they don't have their hands in any sort of, you know, you know, wrongdoings or, or bad stuff. 
but they are the ones who get seen as the bad guys. And I just want people to realize that it has nothing to do with the UFC. Right. And most times after these situations happen, Dana White's in the post-fight press conference just as angry about the decisions as the person that, that lost the fight because it does seem to uh, stain the integrity of the UFC. And I, I think that the judges, they really should have to come out and speak just like Dana does after the fights, just like the fighters do after the fights. And maybe if they could come and give us some reason, we would agree with them. And maybe if they can change our mind on something, then they can educate us and open our eyes to something that we weren't seeing before. I'm always down to give praise when, when it's, you know, due. But also these judges need to get some criticism whenever it's also due. Yeah, and I think criticizing them and bringing stuff like this to light is what's going to really push some change. Mm -hmm. um, not that you and I are going to sit here and affect any change, but right. certainly talking about it does help and, and being more vocal about bad decisions, especially from people like Dana White and the fighters that are on the wrong side of those bad decisions. You talk about people who lost money. You feel for them, but you really feel for the fighter that spent the last four months of his life preparing for a fight that he went in there and executed a game plan, should have won. And, and the other thing is there's a, a show money and then there's show plus win money. So Kai Kara France's paycheck got cut in half thanks to Chris Lee last night and his bad decision making. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just being able to sit down, fill out a scorecard and then disappear behind the curtains. You, you cost somebody a lot of money. You cost somebody a position in the rankings. You cost them potentially a title fight, which if they win, that's a whole hell of a lot more money. You're talking pay-per-view points and things like that. So I, I do think there's some weight and some gravity to the position of judging. And I think it should be taken a little bit more seriously by these guys. And you're right, maybe there is something that they're seeing that we're not seeing, but we know what rules they're supposed to judge by. So we can look at the rule book and it says damage overall, significant strikes, and then you start to get to octagon control and things like that. But round four, if you look at the rule set straight out of the rule book for MMA scoring, I don't believe that anybody could come out and make a case that given the rules that they are abiding by, that Albazi won that round. And so maybe Chris Lee needs to educate all of us and, and teach us a thing or two. But and I'm not too eager. My ego is not too big to say I can't learn something. But I would be very surprised if he could come out and explain his way out of that fourth round decision. Yeah, he'd have to hit us with some pretty serious knowledge and, and facts to sway my right. decision on last night's fight. And, you know, you, you talk about like the criteria and what's most important and damage is always the most important when you're talking about a fight. But what seems to be most important sometimes in these in these uh, poor decisions and these bad calls by these judges is it almost feels like they put uh, octagon control over everything else. And that is not near towards the top of the uh, of the list of what's important. Um, but sometimes if you're a fighter that can fight well off your back foot, if you can circle around the outside well, kind of like what Floyd Mayweather did for his entire career, moved on the outside, picked you apart, didn't get hit. If you do that in MMA and somebody's just charging at you the whole time getting hit like a Terminator and they just refuse to go down, sometimes they can win just on the pure optics that they're chasing you around and it seems like they're bringing the fight to you. And I know people like to see like two guys in there standing bang and whatever, but if somebody's picking somebody else apart and they happen to be moving on their back foot, they happen to be circling off and, and doing good techniques that MMA fighters, you know, study and dream about having one day in their arsenal, then uh, you might have to switch your style if you're going to have to win, which that makes it very difficult to, you know, have a successful career in this. And, you know, if you do these sort of raw decisions, these bad deals to some guys a couple of times over, they could be out of the UFC and working a regular job again before right. they know it. And they might be a legitimate UFC talent that just doesn't have the style that fits with these judges. So as weird as it sounds, these fighters at this current state of the UFC need to take matters into their own hands. And there's one in particular, Sugar Sean, that does this. He goes, I'll fight anywhere if the UFC wants me to. I've gone to, you know, uh, Fight Island and he's about to fight in Boston. But he's like, I'll just go back and forth to Vegas. The, yeah. the, the pay's better. I don't have to give so much. He's like, I don't really care about fighting at Madison Square Garden. The judging is awful up in New York and they're going to take more money and taxes and all this stuff. So he's got it right for some reasons. But also start to look at the, the judging who are going to be judging the card that you're going to fight on. And if you know that it's somebody like a Chris Lee or somebody who's known for screwing people over in bad decisions and you're a, you happen to be a decision fighter or you happen to be going in there against somebody who might, you know, force you all three or all five rounds, 
it might be best to say, you know, I'm good to fight this guy, but I want to do it in this state instead of that state. You know, just yeah, get creative. It, it, it's it's a really smart thing to say. Unfortunately, last night's example, it, it was in Vegas, yeah. which is typically the, you know, when you're looking at, I don't think it's good and bad. I think it's varying degrees of bad, worse, and, and yeah. you know, ridiculous. Uh, unfortunately, last night aired on the side of ridiculous, but it, it was in Vegas. But there's certainly like New York, they'll stop a fight quick. A mm -hmm. doctor will get in there and you have a, a little bit of scar tissue in your face like Nate Diaz and they see too much blood, fight's over with. So mm -hmm. I, I think Sugar was really smart. And then, you know, with regards to the taxes and all that, it's a whole different subject. But O'Malley is one of those buttoned up guys and he's he's gotten to where he is in his career right now because he's been very smart and very calculated with his antics, with his requests, and now he's fighting for a title and he's one of the biggest draws in the UFC. But moving into a fight that the judging will probably not be needed in, Alex Pereira is gonna take on Jan Blachowicz in his 205 debut. Now, the Polish power is known for having some of the best knockouts at 205 in recent memory, but Alex Pereira is seen as one of the most lethal strikers in the UFC. It seems to me like there's a clear-cut advantage in the grappling department for Blahovich, but he says he wants to test his striking against Poetan. So my question to you is, one, on a scale of one to a million, how excited are you for this fight? Uh, and then also, do you think Jan should make this a grappling affair, or do you think he should test his abilities on the feet with Poetan? Well, on the scale, it's a right at about a million because Alex Pereira has made me a very in invested fan, and I find him to be an entertaining person. I think he's really scary. He's intimidating. He looks like a bad guy in a, in a superhero movie. So I'm in on this experiment, but I want to say Alex Pereira is an experiment in my opinion, and the UFC brought him up, and they fast-tracked him, you know, top 10 fastest tracks to the UFC title that we've seen. Oh, yeah. You know, you've got your Brock Lesnar's and, you know, there's a few people that, that stood out and that really had a meteoric rise. Conor McGregor obviously had a nice, you know, rise to the top. But Alex Pereira moved up very quickly and it was all because he had this prior life that Izzy Adesanya and him, you know, had some synergy with and he was the, the boogeyman to the UFC's champion. And I really did love the story. We talked about it a few times on the channel how... He was like the guy on somewhere, some corner of the globe. He just happens to be in the Amazon of Brazil and he's this scary guy. And the UFC looks really good when they're like, look, we've got our champion. We think he's the best fighter in the world, but we need to find out if he act actually is. And then some guy raises his hands and says, oh, I beat him twice and knocked him out. And, you know, he's never beaten me. And so they find that guy. Obviously, he can't just go right into a title fight having like two or three MMA fights, but they put him on the right track to get him to a title fight. And then he's obviously there. He, he makes history, becomes a UFC champion. And then, you know, we get an amazing storyline out of those two guys. I think that's one that UFC fans are going to remember for a very long time. But I still look at Alex Pereira as a bit of an experiment. And he's sort of like Hamzat Jemayev where we didn't really know how good he was going to be. We assume he's pretty good. We saw him in there a couple of times. He looks really good. And we've sort of realized, okay, Hamzat Jemayev belongs in title fights. He's good enough to fight for a title at 185 or 170. And uh, he's got the skills to back it up. Pierre is a little bit different. Styles make matchups and he got good styles all the way up to the belt. And that was partially the UFC's doing. They wanted to get him to Izzy and stubbing his toe on the way wouldn't have really helped him. And it, they wouldn't have been able to have this awesome story. Well, now he's just a contender, and he just happens to be another guy in the UFC, but he also is a former champion. And when you're talking about a former champion that only has about eight fights versus a former champion like the Polish power, Jan Blachowicz. Dozens of fights. Yeah, yeah. dozens of fights, and, and just he's been in there with everybody, all the styles at 205 that you can imagine. Uh, it starts to really show you that, all right, if Alex Barrera is as legit as we think he is, we're going to find him in the weight class that I believe he truly belongs at, which is 205. And we're going to see him in there, not on a, on a safe path to the title, but with anybody else that shows up in the division. And I think Jan Blachowicz is a great uh, first fight for him, but that's one hell of a draw to get for your first fight at 205. Yeah, no doubt. And there was some real calculated and brilliant matchmaking that got Alex to that title fight unscathed at 185. And there was clear purpose for that. As you said, there was the history there. The UFC scoured the earth and found a guy. This guy beat Izzy twice. One time he put him on oxygen. So we're mm -hmm. going to see if he can beat him in MMA. And then he did, you know, mm -hmm. which is the, even the, the crazier thing. And then Izzy came back to regain his title. So it's a beautiful legacy story for Adesanya as well. But that's all over with. It may, it may happen again, but I think if it does happen, 
happening and it'll happen at 205 and some things really have to shake out perfectly for that to happen. But otherwise, I think that the Izzy um, Pereira chapter may be closed. And now Alex is just being thrown to the wolves at 205 because there is nobody that he put on an oxygen mask at 205. There is nobody he beat in kickboxing at 205. There's just some killers and really fun matchups. And the matchmakers are saying this guy got his favors on the way up at 185. He's getting no favors now. And I don't think he wants favors. I don't. He's not the kind of guy that's asking for favors from the UFC. I think he wants the best matchups. And to me, Jan Blachowicz is that. Jan Blachowicz, the Polish power is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been a couple times recently where he said, I thought I left my Polish power in the dressing room, which I thought was kind of funny for John to say, but that can come out at any time. Jan Blachowicz has the great equalizer, which is he can put the lights out on anybody at any given time. I think Alex is a little bit more of a complete stand-up striker from a Muay Thai perspective, but make no mistake about it, for as long as Jan is standing there trading with Alex, he can knock him out. And if Izzy Adesanya can knock him out, uh, Jan Blahovic can damn sure knock him out, but that also goes the other way. Alex can knock Jan Blahovic out, so I literally cannot wait for this fight. I I'm not ready to make a prediction yet. I think it could go either way, but I think this is a number one contenders match at 205, and the winner, if they step in there against Jamal Hill, or if Jamal has his business with Yuri first and Yuri gets his belt back, however that shakes out, give me any combination of Jan Blahovic, mm -hmm. Alex Pereira, Jamal Hill, and Yuri Prohaska. You slice and dice that up any way you want to dice it up mm -hmm. and sign me the hell up for that fight. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. And I think that 205 is in good hands right now. Jamal Hill's kind of, you know, taking care of the being the fun champion that, that's entertaining, you know, on and off the uh, the microphone. And One of the best Instagrams in the game, by right, the way. Right, right. Derek Lewis has always been the best Instagram on, on uh, uh, for all the fighters. But Jamal Hill is now take, coming up, yeah. and he's getting a close second spot because he's got a very entertaining channel. And he's also not just reposting stuff, but he's like making his own little videos, and they're always funny. He's and, putting effort into it. Yeah. I can respect that he's scripting videos. Yeah. and like it, it, I Respect to Jamal Hill. I think the champ doesn't get the credit he deserves sometimes because he doesn't look like the most technical fighter in there at times. But Jamal Hill's a damn good fighter, and he's a great entertainer. I think he's good for the sport, and I'm going to give him some credit if nobody else will. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's I hit you, you don't hit me, and if you go to sleep, then I get the belt. And yeah. that's what he's done so far. And I can't wait to see you know him in there with Yuri. I think that's a fun fight. And you know when you talk about Pejera moving into – a, a, a division where you've got Jamal Hill and you've got Yuri and even Jan, I'll throw him in there. You're talking about some dynamic strikers for big guys and people with lots of power, but also lots of skills. And they aren't really just one trick ponies. So I think Pierre is going to be looking really good and, and, and fill out that 205 frame perfectly. He's not going to look undersized. Like no. how Izzy looked when he moved up to 205. Well, he looks way bigger than Glover. When you see yeah. them pictured together, training together, like it looks like if you were to tell me one of them's the, the 205 champ and one of them's the one 85 champ that it would be the other way around but it is in fact it was in fact not yeah yeah, yeah. and and Jan's a big guy but he's he's not going to be able to just simply overpower Pihera on the feet if they take this fight to the ground I think there's some major holes in Alex Pereira's game and we're going to see him at 205 because everybody knows they don't want to stand and trade with him because he is actually very dangerous on the feet and can knock anybody out at any time uh, especially with that front hook but they did see him show a few kinks in his armor on the floor. If Izzy's able to control you, imagine what Jan can do. Imagine what some of these other people. Anthony Smith would probably be a, a nightmare. To Magomed get and Kalaya have you. Exactly. These are some guys that saw what happened with him. Now they understand there's a former champion that just joined our division, and we think we could get the jump on him simply because he doesn't have the style to beat us if we can get the fight to the ground. Easier said than done to get Pierre to the ground, but I think Jan Blahovic is going to strike with him for the first little bit. He's going to feel him out a little bit, show him that he's not afraid of him because the you know if you go in there basically looking to just grab somebody's legs and put them down, you're telling them that I don't want any business striking with you. I'm almost afraid to strike with you, and I don't want to do that. Jan's not that kind of guy. He's going to go in there show him that he's not afraid to strike with him. And then right when he th has Alex Pereira, assuming that he's willing to stand and strike, he's going to take him down and then he's going to start stealing some rounds and zapping the energy out of Poetan. And this is a very tough fight for Poetan, but I do think that, you know, if somebody's going to be able to move up to 205 and find some success right at the top of the heap at the, in the top five, it is Alex Pereira, but I, I don't know. I think early predictions, and I know once we see some more footage and whatnot out of these two, we're going to be able to make a decision. 
but I'm probably going with Jan Blahovich on this one. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not ready to make a call yeah. yet. Uh, but we do need to make some predictions for UFC 289. Mm. Uh, we have Charles Oliveira versus Benny Dariush. To me, this feels like a number one contenders match if Benny wins. Yeah. Unless, I think Charles kind of has to do something really emphatic to get that rematch with Makachev to where mm. people are like really clamoring to see that because we already saw that and we saw Charles, unfortunately, get kind of dominated. So, and 185 just, or I'm sorry, we were just talking about Alex mm. Pereira, who's now moving up to 205. 155, rather, has some really good fighters, some really interesting matchups for Makachev. His first title defense was against Volkanovski, who deserved that title fight, but in all reality is not a 155er. And so I think Islam Makachev needs to be in there with some fresh blood at 155, somebody who actually competes and has competed for a while at 155, who he's not already defeated and, mm -hmm. and finished. And so I think that person is Benny, if he can get past Charles. Benny Daryush is a number one contender through and through. He's on a nine fight win streak. This one will be 10 if he is able to get past Charles. And I mean, if you take out a, a former champion like Charles Oliveira in your 10th win in a row, I mean, how the hell can you not give Benny the title shot? I know Justin and Dustin have their rematch coming up, and I think that's a contingency title number one contender if Charles were to win. But I think if Benny wins, I hope the UFC will do the right thing and give him his title shot. Yeah, and I think they will. And there, there's a great storyline there. I know, you know, we don't really like to talk about, like, religion versus religion, and that's not what I'm saying at all, but he is a very, you know, serious reli uh, religious man, and so is Islam. So yeah. I think that there's not really a feud there, but it's almost like a respect thing. We'd yeah. like to see these two go after it and, and really just uh, show full signs of respect between one another, and we're going to get a great fight out of them. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, Benny and, and Charles Oliveira are kind of similar. You know, they've got a similar build. They're both pretty good at striking, and, and but they like their submissions. But I do think that the submission game of Benny Darius is very different than the submission totally. game of Charles Oliveira. Charles is okay with being on his back sometimes. I don't think Benny Dar Darius is near as comfortable being on his back or complacent down there. I think he really does like to push the pace, you know, get people in some weird positions that you don't often see in MMA. He loves his leg locks, as we've seen. He's very, very good on that aspect of MMA. And I think we could see him, you know, give Islam some very difficult things to deal with because one thing that the, uh, the, the Dagestani fighters do a lot is they pressure forward. They pressure forward. And sometimes if you can work a specific jujitsu game, kind of like what Benny does, you can get a hold of a leg with all that weight that they've got. You know, they're putting all their weight on you to keep you, you know, tied down. You can wind up inverting a little bit and maybe, you know, reaching for something. I don't really see him submitting Islam Makashev no. and getting the belt from him. But I think if he wins this fight against Charles Oliveira, he does deserve the title fight. And I think it'd be a really fun fight. And it would actually be bigger than maybe people are predicting. Yeah, I think it would. And, and I think you hit the nail right on the head with as far as these guys are both very respectable, both very religious uh, family men. Yeah. And, you know, to see that that's kind of a breath of fresh air at 155. Right. 155 has been kind of a wild division yeah. for a while, minus the Khabib, you know, time that he was the champion. But with Conor McGregor and, and everything that happened there, it's it's been kind of a wild ride mm -hmm. at 155. So to see two guys like Benny and, and uh, Makashev go at it for a title, I think would be a very high highly skilled matchup and one where you could see big numbers be pulled from two guys that don't trash talk one another, yeah. which I think is, is kind of nice. And so when you look at, at Benny's game compared to Charles Oliveira's game, I totally agree with you. Benny is also very good at defending the takedown. Matus Gamrot is a strong, tenacious grappler who has cardio for days, and he had a very hard time getting Benny down. If I remember correctly, he landed like three or four takedowns to like 20 attempts. I mean, mm -hmm. he was trying, trying, and trying again, and very few times did he get Benny down, and he didn't really need to do anything to speak of once he got Benny to the ground, and Benny was extremely powerful on the feet, precise, calculated. He's more of a, of a cerebral, calculated striker than Charles is. Charles is kind of balls to the wall, throw caution to the wind and try to knock you out so they're while they both do have great submission skills and they both are good on the feet they're for very different reasons and I don't think you're going to see Benny concede the back unless he's trying to work a heel hook or something like that which he's very good at Charles likes to throw those triangles up those arm bars that's that's just not Benny's game Benny is pressure from the top and he's doing damage rinse and repeat 
I'm I'm liking Benny in this fight. I think he's going to win. I think he's as good as Charles across the board, but I think he's just a little bit more calculated. I think he's going to have the sharper game plan, and I think he's going to hit Charles with some things that hurt him early to make him think, and that's going to give him the time to really open up his striking. I don't believe that Charles is going to take him down to the ground. I think this is going to be actually more of a, a fight that takes place on the feet unless Benny gets to the point that he wants to do some ground and pound. And so I think he's going to probably squeeze two or three of the rounds um, and, and just cruise to a decision victory. I, I don't see him finishing Oliveira, maybe, but I, I'm, I'm going to stick with a decision for Benil Daryush here. Yeah, well, and it's a three-round fight, right? Yeah. So it, this is one of those situations where Charles Oliveira is a very good fighter, but he comes out from the very first bell and goes to you know, take your head off. Yeah. Everybody always looks at, you know, people like Justin Gaethje is, and Michael Chandler as the most entertaining fighters at 55. They always forget Charles. Charles is just like them. He fights the same. You know, he has that crazy style and, you know, he'll get knocked down and then 10 seconds later, get up and knock you down. And it's just a very entertaining style of fighting that I think gets, you know, kind of brushed over because there's so many, you know, explosive fighters at 55. But Benny knows how to formulate a game plan. He's very, you know, strict when he does decide what he's going to do and he executes it very well and he hits harder than a lot of people think I think his striking is a bit underrated and with Charles you know getting hit because he's willing to engage so early and so often in fights uh, we could see him in a little bit of trouble fighting from behind in, in the second and third round and that could leave him you know a little bit desperate and looking for you know crazier Hail Marys to win the fight. So I think Benny knows this is probably his only opportunity to get to a number one contender spot and to get a title shot. So he's got to really perform and he's got to fight a perfect game plan. You're talking about Oliveira, who's been there many times. So he knows what it takes to become the world champion, but he also knows he's already been the world champion. And sometimes once you've reached the top of the mountain, all you can do is just sit there and, and enjoy the view while you've got it because it's not going to come again. And uh, I think there's always a little bit more hunger in the person that's never reached the pinnacle of the mountain as opposed to the person that's already been there. And also the person that feels like they've done enough and have done enough for quite some time and have been continually denied. I think Benny's going to come out and try to make a statement here. I think yeah. you know he's going to go for the finish. I'm still going to stick with my prediction of, of a decision, a clear-cut decision for Daryush, but I think Benny's going to come out with a chip on his shoulder and a point to prove, and I think we may see the best Daryush yet, which is going to set up for a great fight between him and Makashev. And now moving into the main event, it wasn't the main event that was originally billed, but I actually much prefer it. I'm glad we're going to see some fresh blood in there against Amanda. There's very few people in the heavier women's weight classes that really can make noise. And, and you, you can only shuffle the deck so many ways to make it interesting before you're just recycling the same fights over and over and over again. And that's kind of what it would have been with Pena, I think she got the jump on Amanda when Amanda was unfocused, and, and I don't know what happened. That was a fluke. Amanda came back, showed it was a fluke, and and I'm cool with not seeing that Pena trilogy for right now. I think Irene Aldana is a very deserving contender. She's got excellent boxing. She's a larger woman, like as mm -hmm. far as stature is concerned, so she's going to not look undersized in there. And like I said, her hands are very good. So I'm interested. I still think Amanda's going to win the fight. I'm, I'm not going to bury the lead there. My prediction is going to be that Nunez wins the fight because I think she's, quite frankly, the best female fighter that we've ever seen. Uh, and Irene Aldana will probably be a champion at some day, but I, I think it'll be after the Lioness retires. Yeah, and I think Amanda only has a few more fights left. You know, she's done everything you could possibly want to do in this sport, and she's one of the goats. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't call her the female goat. She's the just, quote, she, all that yeah, nonsense. She's yet, just yeah. one of the best. Yeah. You know, and and what she's done in the range she's had over two divisions is is very impressive she's not the most talented female valentina shevchenko is the agreed, most talented agreed. but she is the most dominant ufc female champion that we've ever had and i think that irene aldana is a very good fighter she's i think she's a little bit young so she's going to be around for several years and there's some great matchups for her and i think stylistically she matches up worse against like a pena and, and some of the other girls at the top of 135 even worse than uh, Amanda does. But I think Amanda has the style to beat Irene Aldana, and she's obviously been to the top of the heap. She's been the main event many, many times in the co-main event and fighting for titles five rounds, way more than Irene has. And I think that's going to help her, you know, with her confidence and just going into the fight itself. Now, on the other aspect, Irene wants to become the fourth 
you know, Mexican champion that there is and the current Mexican champions, you know, we got everybody, yeah. you know, Brandon Moreno's there and uh, yeah, you know, it's an interim, but he's still got one Alexa Grasso. So she'd love to join their company and become one of the, the Mexican champions. And she's got a great style. She's very powerful. And I don't predict this fight going to decision because both of these ladies can knock people out. But Amanda Nunes did not look like Amanda Nunes when we saw her lose to Juliana Pena. She just simply didn't. She was fighting with awful technique. And I, I hope that, you know, she can take that with a grain of salt because that was the worst performance we've ever seen out of Amanda Nunes. It looked like, you know, somebody who was in one of their first five fights as a professional. She just not, threw caution to the wind. It was like, I'm going to go out there and slug and yeah. whoever knocks the other one out first is the wind. It was a weird, it was a weird night. Right. And some people say like uh, a lot of athletes, I was guilty of this when I was, you know, growing up playing hockey. If I played against a team that wasn't very good, some, some of those games I wouldn't play very good. But if I played against one of the best teams in the world or one of the best teams at the tournament, I would rise to the occasion yeah. and have some of my best games. And I think Amanda Nunes does that. If you give her a really hard challenge, she's going to rise to the occasion. But if you give her somebody that doesn't look like they're on her level, she might just drop her level and then it winds yeah. up being kind of a sloppy fight. I've got Amanda Nunes winning this fight by finish, probably second round finish, uh, TKO. That's a, that's a good call. I'm going to go third round technical knockout yeah. for the Lioness. And she may ride off into the sunset after. I mean, you know what? I'm going to predict a win and a retirement. I, I think yeah. that she may call it a day. You know, and the, the Valentina thing was in play until she lost. And yeah. I just don't see any reason to run that back unless uh, Shevchenko has got a belt around her waist. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know that Amanda sticks around that long. I know her and Nina are continuing to grow their family. And I think they're going to do that uh, outside of competition. So third round knockout. The Lioness retires. She's she's a main eventer this time, not the co-main event, which has been her normal position. Mm-hmm. So look for the gloves to go down into the cage at the end of UFC 289. Yeah, I think she's going to be like a lot of people. She's going to consider consider retirement, but probably not commit to it fully. And then who knows? Hopefully we see her in there a few more times. But if this is her last one, it's been one hell of a career. That it has. Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button and leave us a comment down below. We'll see you next time. Peace.